Yes, yes. Good afternoon already, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, our esteemed guests. I hope everyone has had a chance to have a cup of coffee and digest what you heard during the previous session. We're not only talking about history, we're talking about literature. Um, literature is indispensably linked to history. And the events that we live through as contemporaries uh, also are linked to literary works. They um, uh, reflect the epoch and the um, notion and understanding of epoch by the uh, writer. History and literature have been indispensably and intertwined, uh, connected and intertwined. Uh, the uh, word of the uh, Igarev army and others are primordial literary sources uh, that are Russian canon are uh, as historical as they are literal, literary in nature. Uh, outstanding historians like Karamzin Lamanosov and Solovyov used to be writers. And our uh, outstanding writers, uh, Pushkin, Gogol, Tolstoy, all the writers who contributed to the world fame of the Russian literature acted also as very knowledgeable historians in what they wrote. The, uh, historians that reflect their epoch, and they contributed greatly to popularizing of history. We are going to talk about popularization of history through um, artistic word, but I'd like to remind all uh, those present here and those who wish to get themselves familiarized with the Russian literature. Uh, Belinsky, uh, an important Russian literary critic, used to call Evgeny Anegin, Eugene Anegin, by Alexander Pushkin, an encyclopedia of the Russian soul. Alexander Pushkin, the creator of the modern Russian language and literature, used to refer to this novel of his as, as a, a real historical epoch uh, developed in the fictional narration of the writer. Any literary piece reflects the interest of the authors to the history and past of the homeland. It is not possible to reflect the feelings and the ideas of the nation without understanding the historical evolution that this or that nation made, be it Charles Dickens or Shakespeare, uh, Prosper, Mary May of Victor Hugo, or Alexander Dumas, Stefan Zweig, or Eric Maria Remark, or Leo Tolstoy, or Alexei Tolstoy, Ivan Efremov. All of them gave the world the descriptions and reflections of their epoch seen with the eyes of their contemporaries helped us to f uh, feel the atmosphere of the time. Their writings were translated in hundreds of foreign languages, and these formed the basis for an inter- or cross-cultural dialogue. Today, in the framework of our forum, we are going to speak about our panelists, about how history and liter literature um, are connected, what is the role of historical memory and artistic world in promotion of uh, the historical memory of a nation and w what the cultural workers have to rely on in working the policy towards uh, maintaining uh, cross-cultural dialogue. So before I turn the floor over to one of the panelists of our today's discussion, I would like to say a few words about him. Um, the first to speak will be Christopher Reed. Uh, we will. Uh, Christopher Reed is uh, the professor of history 
at the University of Warwick from the UK. And as far as I understand, he's a major expert on the left, uh, leftist and com communist movement. So Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin as a, uh, are uh, names very well known for him as a uh, writer and a history expert. But we're going to speak about the professional historiography and uh, fiction. It is, I'm turning the floor over to Mr. Reed. Uh, it's your turn. Thank you very much indeed for your kind introduction. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here at this gathering in this beautiful city, which I came to for the first time over 50 years ago uh, in 1970. And I was a student here in 1971, 1972, a stagiaire at what was then Leningradsky Gosudarstvini Universitet Imini Zdanova. Uh, times have changed, um, but it's a great pleasure and, uh, and a great honor to be here. Thank you very much for asking me to come along. Um, I'm going to say a few words about how I, as a historian, have used literature in my work, maybe have time to give one or two very small examples, particularly of this city and uh, uh, it's the events here which played a large part in my life because I'm, I'm a specialist in the history of the uh, Russian Revolution in 1917. Um, and I, I'd like to go back to the times, I suppose it's actually close to when I did start my uh, professional career. Uh, at the beginning of postmodernism, there was an American critic called Hayden White who told us that history was fiction that there was no real extra truth claim behind historical knowledge and historical writing compared to literary writing. Now, of course, that was extremely controversial at the time, and I was never even remotely convinced of it for a moment, um, because what White seemed to have forgotten to some extent is that history historians though every history um, uh, monograph that appears, every history book that appears is a fiction, it comes from the mind of the historian, uh, none of us as historians believe that we're actually presenting a complete representation of truth of the past. We can't do that. Um, it's, it's beyond us, but we can, and the important thing which uh, people who like Hayden White forgot was that as historians we use evidence and that we don't just make it up as we go along. Our task is to interpret fact, to interpret, it, it, interpret evidence, to work within the confines of what the past has left behind. And of course literature is one very important area of that. I was going to talk a little bit about painting but I think we're supposed to stick to literature. We could also talk about architecture. I mean, for me, this is a fantastic building to be in. Uh, buildings represent the values of a society. If you want to know what a society values most, uh, look at which its, which its biggest buildings are. But in this building on the night of October the 24th, this was full of red guards, this was full of mutinous soldiers. They'd gone upstairs to arrest the general staff and they were preparing to go and take the Winter Palace, which actually leads to one of the great historical myths as well, the storming of the Winter Palace. If we're going to talk about the, uh, it was hinted at in the previous session as well, the power of film to distort reality and to replace reality. The idea of the storming of the Winter Palace is very, very strongly entrenched in the history of the revolution. Many people refer to an event which actually never happened. What did happen, of course, was Eisenstein made a film of it. And he was also in this building and filmed it. And people take the film uh, more acquainted with it than they are with the, um, with the um, actual realities of it. So we, our literature can be helpful, but of course they can uh, get in the way. Um, so Hayden White was partly correct. We do, uh, a history book is created by the historian, um, but it's not fiction. 
And what he forgot, I think, uh, and which I think is important for us to remember as historians, is that not only is, uh, is history partly fiction, but as was so eloquently presented by uh, the chairman in a few moments ago, fiction is also history. Uh, that's the part that he forgot. And history, uh, fiction can play into history. Every artistic artifact is itself a contribution to our historical knowledge and our historical, fact, uh, our historical background. So um, it's, I think that um, we need to uh, bear that in mind. And uh, I just. There is a two way relationship uh, in that sense between literature, between fiction, let's call it the artistic world, and history, in my view, uh, which is the first of all, history is an aspect in artistic and cultural production. Uh, again, as the, uh, the chairman was uh, explaining to us, that we can inject history into our literature, but also the historical, um, I mean, the, the, the piece of literature or the artistic um, artifact uh, contributes precisely to our knowledge of the past. Not necessarily, obviously, the past portrayed in that piece of literature or art. Um, that's the original, one of the original fallacies, like the fallacy, in a sense, of the one we have about the storming of the Winter Palace. You think it happened because it's in the movie. Uh, we don't necessarily think things happen the way they do because they're described as such in novels. There's a gap between the reality of it and the actuality of it. But the two-way relationship is that that novel tells us, again, I think as our chairman mentioned, that um, a piece of art will tell us what people were preoccupied with in the past very often or at their own particular times. And if it's a piece of historical art, looking back to the past, why they interpret it in that particular way at that particular time. So we have to go through a double, triple process of filtration when we interpret and understand literature and art. Um, and we can also use them, we can use them for many reasons. Um, I think there's many, many uh, uh, advantages uh, and, and, uh, in using uh, literature and art. And I think there's perhaps uh, three. Um, artistic literature itself can incorporate historical knowledge uh, if we want to do so, if we think of, uh, think of anybody, any of the great names that were just mentioned, let, let's think of Gorgol. Uh, Gorgol writes about the school inspector, now it's, it's a story, but reminds us of exactly the kind of situation which he uh, portrays in the middle of that kind of story. So there is historical knowledge there which we can uh, pick upon, and it kind of, um, Literature and art can produce historical knowledge by stimulating historians and stimulating actors uh, who want to understand the past uh, by suggesting the way things were. Not by portraying the way things were, but by suggesting so we can then form a hypothesis, we can test our hypothesis against other information, we can test our hypothesis against other forms of evidence. Um, so, uh, literature has a very complex uh, interrelationship. Let me just um, give one or two small examples before I finish this um, introduction about art and literature that I tend to use in my teaching of history and in my understanding of history. Um, and why not take an example from Petrograd? Uh, Alexander Bloch's wonderful poem, The Twelve. Um, I asked my students to read it. And for those of you familiar with it, I'm sorry, uh, you'll know what I'm, I mean, but the poem is about 12 rough and ready red guards uh, sometime in December, January 1917, 1918, on patrol at night, 
controlling, uh, patrolling a curfew. Uh, there are a number of events which occur, the central one of which is that they find one of their former colleagues breaking the curfew, they shoot him, they shoot his female companion, who's the former girlfriend of one of the 12, and they continue walking through the streets, swearing, cursing, uh, be, um, firing shots occasionally. Uh, I don't think they're actually drunk, but uh, they're portrayed as very, very flawed human beings. Uh, carrying through this patrol. And then, out of nowhere, at the end, Block brings in a figure of Jesus Christ who emerges and leads them and walks ahead of them. And people say, where on earth does that come from? What is Block trying to tell us? Now, different people can have different interpretations of this, but for me and for my, uh, what I try to pass on to my students was the idea that although the revolution was very crude and it was violent and it was created by particularly flawed individuals, at the end of the day, so was, for example, Christianity. The Divinalsa, the Twelve, become the Twelve Apostles of a new religion. Uh, that, and this reminds us, and I, I did a, a piece on the centenary of the revolution, where it seemed to me that what was the essence of the revolution in 1917, the action of the people like those Red Guards, has been almost cut out everywhere, not just in Russia, uh, where the whole of the, of the October revolution has been uh, diminished, in the, it was diminished in the ceremonial, in the, in the memory, uh, but in other places, the revolution has become about Bolsheviks and liberals and uh, political leaders and elites, whereas it really was about ordinary people. That's what Bloch's telling us. There's also a very interesting painting by Chagall. This is how I was going to do some paintings. I look at some paintings, um, which you may know, called Revolution 1917, which is an extraordinary piece, because the, at the center of it, it has, standing upside down on one hand, a figure of Lenin uh, looking straight at the viewer and his hand is out this way, the hand is not balancing on and on his uh, left hand side is a picture of suffering of a crowd of people who are uh, engaged, uh, who are um, lamenting, there's one or two people who appear to be ill, dying and on the other side, there's a ray of sunshine. There's uh, singing, dancing, playing, uh, theater. Um, and although Chagall's not a noted revolutionary, we can look at that painting and say, well, Chagall's trying to say what Bloch said. This was a revolution of ordinary people, and they are going to create something great. Um, they didn't <laughs> uh, in, the, in the short term, obviously, uh, as it happens, but it reminds us that that was spirit of the time. So we can use art, literature, um, novels to remind us uh, of aspects of the past which we might otherwise have forgotten uh, and which, which stimulate us to, to, to reconsider it. So it, and it's a very deeply integral part of our understanding of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Reed, thank you. Thank you for reminding us of Alexander Bloch. And before I give the floor to our next speaker, allow me to ask you one question. Well, you certainly uh, uh, watched Eisenstein's October, uh, who uh, presented uh, the events occurring here in the square in front of the uh, General Staff Building. Is it... Um, uh, well, can an artist distort uh, in such a way the facts or the spirit of the revolution that he renders justifies the distortion of facts? Um, I think it's up to the viewer to be very well uh, uh, um, versed in how to read these things. Uh, it's very, yes, Eisenstein's very good at, at doing what um, 
Bloch and Chagall were doing, in a sense, in their way, just talking about the enthusiasm of the revolution. But uh, we, we, he, I think it's absolutely the case that the storming of the Winter Palace is a cliché of the writing about the October Revolution. If you read the diaries of people at the time, uh, evidence, and I think the best one is by Nikolai Sukhanov, he wrote a superb series of memoirs of 1917, he points out that, oh yes, the soldiers were milling around in the square, there was no fighting, there was no firing, but in fact, they got in and out of, there were people going in and out of the Winter Palace by the side gates without any um, problem at all. And when they infiltrated the uh, Winter Palace, they simply walked in and there was no storming, there was no resistance, there was, there was well, very little resistance. And they just went in and they, 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 they walked through the palace till they, till they found the provisional government, who was sitting there terrified, as you would be, uh, arrested them, marched them out of the palace, across the bridge to the Peter Paul Fortress, and left them there for about 12 hours, and then just let them go. <laughs> um, it was a very different series of events. So artists can be, I mean, I don't say they have a responsibility to tell the truth about the past, uh, because they can interpret it, they're free to write about it as they wish and as they want to do. But for us as viewers and uh, absorbers and readers or whatever it is on the medium, it's up to us uh, and, and, uh, to interpret what they're saying, but not to take it as a facsimile of what actually happened. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And we continue now. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Akbar Riskulov to speak up. He is representative of the Kyrgyz literature and uh, uh, an important component of Kyrgyz poetry was the Akin's um, artistic work. In the, back in the Soviet school we did study um, Akin culture, uh, but not enough, uh, definitely. From our school curriculum, I remember that these people's poets, philosophers uh, of Kyrgyz uh, that were called Akin were, the, were foundational for the future successes of Kyrgyz literature. And I'd like to note uh, definitely Chinggis Aitmatov's creative works. He, he was translated in many foreign languages. And uh, he still remains one of the favorite authors of uh, my generation and other generations, of course. So today we have a uh, representative of Kyrgyz literature, Akbar. Riskulov, could you please share your ideas of literature and, lit and history and their connections? Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for their kind invitation to be here, uh, to be with you in the framework of this session and speak from heart to heart. I would like to see our forum, which is uniting cultures, uniting the northern Palmyra uh, um, would uh, have an opportunity to further develop on an international scale. The goals and objectives of this forum are very much in line. Goals and objectives of the forum are very much in line with the, uh, the challenges and uh, needs of the future. Um, I would like to provide some Examples from the life and creative work of our classical writers. Uh, uh, first came the word, and uh, it's what Chinggis Aitmatov used to write. Uh, the word uh, is the, the god from the heavens. Uh, the word gives milk to the universe and feeds us on the milk, on that milk from uh, century to century. So with outside the word, there is no God, no universe, no 
strengths in the world that would surpass that of the word. Uh, these wise and very much um, visionary words are taken from his last novel, When the Mountains Fall. I think uh, this, this novel was not a simple piece of writing. It was uh, something that he, his will, what he bequeathed to further generations. In 1990s, th this writer initiated another forum, Isikul based forum, that brought together the bright minds of the world. And according to politicians, it was due to this forum that the uh, dividing uh, wall between the two poles was uplifted, and I think our forum is going to develop along uh, the same lines. Uh, another very well-known novel of Chinggis Aitmatov and uh, uh, the day lasting for more than a century. The action is set in a little um, uh, a remote village. It happens within one day, but it lasts for more than a century in terms of the cosmic magnitude of what is has happening. Uh, so this is a line from Pasternak's poem. So one day lasts for more than a century, and the hug is never ending. Uh, Chengiz Aitmata filled it with an epic um, meaning. A crucial importance of a writer is um, filled with different mystiques. Our forum is happening during the days when we celebrate the 95th anniversary of this great artist and writer. Uh, he's known across the world, and the print run uh, of his writings exceeded 100 million copies. Chaitmata was a bilingual writer, both Kyrgyz and Russian, because the most important works of his he created using the language of Tolstoy and Pushkin. Uh, 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 Rasul Gamzatov, another important poet, dedicated uh, such verses, such lyrics to his friend. Go on the rider, hoping for your horse, touch the heavens, no, no barriers. My half-European, well-known uh, friend, my well-known half-Asian brother. The bitter days that bef uh, befell us when we lost our mentor, our teacher, just divided our lives into before and after Chengiz Aitmatov, and we were to live in a different dimension after he passed away. And I decided to go to visit the homeland uh, of um, Chengiz Aitmatov. He was a young boy running at the foot of the mountains there once. And I think I have a moral right to pass over to you, the participants of this forum, the uh, best wishes and hello from those mountains and the clouds up in the sky. Thank you very much for your very useful and uh, interesting comments. Thank you for reminding us about the outstanding son of uh, Kyrgyz nation, Chengiz Aitmatov, who was really bilingual and he wrote both in Kyrgyz and Russian alike. And I'd like to um, tell our audience that this year the anthology uh, of uh, Kyrgyz, modern Kyrgyz literature was published. So Kyrgyz poets and writers were not translated into Russian for some time. And this anthology includes the Kyrgyz writings translated into Russian over the last 30 years. We move on. And uh, we are uh, taking a little bit more um, uh, the 
eastern and um, the, the uh, side uh, of Pamir Mountains that are 7,000 meters high, very popular among mountaineers and uh, climbers and uh, poets alike. So I'm turning the floor over to Nizom Kasim, who is from Tajikistan. And I'd like to ask him, as a representative of the Writers Association of Tajikistan, to share his vision, his perspective on the history, on uh, personality and artistic literature. Thank you very much. I would like, dear friends, to start by thanking those who organized this forum, because in our tough times, getting together, seeing old friends and making new friends is really a meaningful thing for everyone. This is a historical moment uh, for each and any of us here. The history repeats itself. Unfortunately, historic tragedies also repeat today. I here would like to mention uh, a great book by Cengiz Aitmatov and our writer, um, uh, so he quotes um, uh, two minor mining workers who say this. So, with um, 1,000 people, uh, you are alone, and with those people around, you are also alone. So, Rudaki um, used to tell this uh, 1,000 years ago. So, this is spiritual loneliness, um, which uh, awaits us now. Uh, so what happened uh, more than 1,200 years ago, Rudaki felt himself alone among thousands of peoples, uh, people. Aitmatov also felt very similarly in the 20th century. I think that this feeling is perpetual. Every generation feels it. Um, uh, with uh, their own variations. But the um, meaning of literature and its responsibility is different. Literature is about collecting people, um, uh, sending them to do things for the benefit of everyone. And I would like to uh, call uh, upon our classical literature. Uh, you know the uh, Jalaluddin de Balhi, who lived in, in Turkey for a long time, and he's known to the world as Rumi. Uh, um, and uh, he said that. What means? which means we are here to connect the hearts of the people, not to sever these ties, not to disconnect. And I think these words, as never before, are extremely relevant because we see um, uh, an increasing divide between and among people, nations, governments, and it is uh, uh, very, uh, it imperils the world culture, the world history. Um, as to uh, the need of uh, learning more about the history and literature of uh, other nations, absorbing different notions and views, uh, it's an important, though some people mock at that, but I think um, uh, that's the wrong thing to do. Culture is life, as we say. If the person is confined 
to his own national culture only. His life would be um, um, very deprived when he learns more about other people's culture and history. He wants to absorb it. I think his life is getting richer, more fulfilling, and varied. And our responsibility as writers, as I see it, is to present both modernity and history in such a way that it attracts people. So people learn more about the destiny of this writer, of this nation, through his writings. This is a gate to his culture, and we connect people and unite them through this. Oh, thank you very much. I will. Uh, I would like to take this chance and ask you a question. So, um, um, is it uh, possible for an author to uh, to distort historical events, the events that are the context? Um, so let me ask, uh, well, could you repeat the question? So to what extent an author can distort the historical events which are the basis of the uh, literary piece? Now, those of you who are connected to literature in this or that way know that there is the truth of life and there is the truth in literature. And uh, so... All, the, all great authors, all great writers tried to find the golden middle uh, between those two notions. And uh, it seems to me that when this golden middle is found, it is going to be uh, real literature, a true literature. I think the greatest writers um, have been able to find this golden middle. and. Um, now, that is exactly what we call art, and that is literature. Now, we, well, uh, in our literature, up to 1991, up to the disintegration of the uh, Soviet Union, there were just uh, eight historical novels, because um, it's uh, not that easy to write about lit history. Uh, it's uh, a lot of work because one has to read everything that has been written about uh, what you are writing. Um, so much has been written in order to be able to present your own point of view. You need to read all of that. You need to work in the archives, dusty archives. And this is hard work. And uh, um, over the 30 years of our independence, independence of our republics, uh, uh, we uh, there, there have appeared about 40 novels, um, over 30, definitely, over 30 uh, new historical novels. And um, I think uh, that's not serious enough, no. And um, I, th I, I think that is a, a rather slack attitude to the writing of historical uh, books. I think uh, the attitude should be much more uh, serious. So when we talk about historical literature and history in literature, then we always um, um, remember those eight books written in the past, because then the attitude was different. The the the, the different standpoint, uh, the well different penetration into the events, right? Depth of penetration. Well, anyway. We need to find the golden middle, although it's very difficult to do it. It's extremely hard, but there is no other way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we continue. And um, so literature unites everything because uh, word came first. So allow me to give the floor now to um, uh, Munira Dadaeva. Uh, 
she is the director of a drama theater. We will ask her about learning history through theater and theatrical art. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. And good afternoon. I, I'm not a poet, and it's uh, difficult for me to be that. Uh, 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 and it's not easy. So culture can be mass, cultural, elite, material. Uh, each nation has a culture of its own. And uh, dance, uh, dances, uh, the etiquette, the music, singing. Uh, the, 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 there are some similarity between the cultures of certain nations. But at the same time, one can always see the differences and some specific features. If we look into the past, then we can see how the society was being formed, nation and its culture. And the spiritual cal culture associated with science and symbols, elite cultures associated with painting, literature, and architecture. Culture um, is a fundamental element of the understanding of the um, nation, of unique traditions uh, and mode of life. Studying uh, the past and the present of the country, cultural traditions, it's important for the identity of the nation. It's important to know the uh, significant historical events for that purpose. The emergence of independent states, the specifics of the historical way, the political factors, the um, um, political borders, all this was associated with the uh, self-identification of people and look for the manifestation of culture. Language, uh, uh, philosophy have their impact on culture, definitely. The um, formation of culture is a complex and long-term process associated with uh, uh, traditions and heritage and legacy. On the other hand, uh, it's a rethinking of the legacy left by the ancestors. And it's impossible to um, enrich the cultural values without remembering what has been happening, without the um, memory of the uh, traditions accumulated traditions and identity fix the specificity of the society, not only historical um, continuity, which connects uh, um, past with the present, but also look into the future. Learning of uh, 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 tradition through uh, culture makes it possible to understand how interrelated the nations are, and thus it is uh, um, possible to improve the world picture. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move on. I will ask uh, Vadim Gagin, uh, who represents Belarus, to speak about the role of libraries uh, in the formation of historical culture. Thank you for the chance to speak in this beautiful hall at this most interesting session where we can meet people who are uh, thinking, who are looking for truth. Well, but I would rather speak not only about libraries, but about literature and culture in general, uh, since that is uh, the um, um, uh, foundation of our talk. I uh, uh, come, um, no, for the 7th of uh, October for us in Belarus is still a great day. Um, now, going back to what uh, Professor Reed has been speaking about, that's again back to interpretation. But let's go back into history. If we ask a question, either here or in the world elsewhere, who is the most well known representative of the Danish royal family? They will mention Hamlet. Although Hamlet never lived, never existed. Moreover, Hamlet will be among the three most popular Danes, among, uh, along with Niels Bohr and Anderson. But Hamlet never existed. Uh, why is that so? Um, some time ago, uh, Mikhail Pokrovsky, the founder of the Russian Historical School, said history's politics uh, have turned into the past, although he was uh, criticizing the uh, Milikov concept of history. But the phrase became popular, speaking about literature and wider about culture. We can also say that uh, uh, it's a uh, history. Um, um, uh, it's history looking into the past continuously. Cultural images make it possible to um, uh, bring back <coughs> the long gone uh, uh, events and uh, long gone people. An example: if we talk about the October Revolution, the events of those days, the civil war. Um, um, uh, 
um, uh, for uh, two generations at least of Russian people were presented by the stories of Gaidar, by Serafimovich, by the Chapayev movie, by the optimistic tragedy. And so um, the uh, 1960s generation, uh, were, uh, through the words of uh, Akujava, um, still believed in them, although criticized uh, the mode of life and the political structure, but they went back to the literary images, not to the real commissars of the past, but to the literary images of those. And so there was an ideal time presented which stood against the dark days of uh, the uh, cult of personality of Stalin. But in the 1960s, the new attitude to these events was being developed again in culture, like in Shatrov in his um, uh, plays, uh, um, <coughs> the Bolsheviks, uh, the, the introduction of the um, Red Terror, for example, through the uh, liberal uh, language, the Oscold uh, uh, movie, The Commissar, the the big, uh, the flight by Oliver Nomov. That was a very new image of the civil war, which definitely had an impact of what was happening in the society at the time. It was rethinking of the past in those days. Through my life, I went through several um, waves of decline and increase of interest to history, the opening of the archives, the Kalima stories, and um, so that uh, sensation. This is something new to us. And then history turns into a Part of pop culture turns into a clip history, the Parfenov cycle um, uh, on history, where he spoke about different events like the flight of Gagarin within just a minute and a half, and then there was again that singer Pugacheva coming on. So it was reflection. Um, the the, the uh, Arkunin's book on Fandorin is also a very good example of that. No. I talk fast, yes. I also wanted to speak Belarusian, but, well, I won't. So, well, uh, let's, uh, well, I'll talk slower. Right, but, but, but in Belarusian. So out of this history, anyone can draw something for himself. So we spoke about Chinggis Aitmatov here. And let me give you another example of Kupala, our great poet, a Belarusian no, poet, he speaks. It's not enough to hang them on the dry tree. Uh, on the dry, dry tree. They were there. They were selling our land to the Germans, to the Japanese. They they sold to them our son, and so on and so forth. So it's 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 a. Uh, it was um, the poem is in Belarusian. That's a bit difficult. Yes, but. But we are going to stand for you, our Stalin. But there is another Stalin, as Akhmatova, who wrote uh, a poet poems about the great um, um, leader. Uh, but then there was uh, a different story of Kupala, uh, whom uh, we do not even know much about, in the sense that he died in 1942, uh, actually through suicide. So if we look just at the facts and at the research work, then it's not that interesting for the white public. Um, so what are the images that we take out of this uh, history, what becomes popular today. Why is it that um, today, again, certain events become popular, events associated with history? No, so in this um, uh, uh, um, couple, history and um, literature, we should always add politics, ideology. And then the picture becomes more obvious, history, politics, culture, culture, history, politics. So this triangle shows that everything is interconnected. Is that good or bad? It's neither good or bad. It's a, a part, a, an element of the development of humanity. The great historical um, paintings were um, commissioned by the Vatican in order to support the concepts of the Catholic Church. The Counter-Reformation um, provided an um, outburst of Baroque art. This would not have been possible without Reformation. Then um, there is another talk show then, uh, in, in the days of um, 20th century Stalin or uh, Alexander Nevsky. In Belarus, we decided not to have a show like that, choosing between those two. But, the, but of course, the uh, Putin's um, 
uh, speech of the year 2008 in Munich is closely associated with all of that and with the new political events, which uh, again uh, make us focus on history and its uh, manifestation in culture. We are in the focus of this struggle, of this interconnection, of this post-revolutionarity, so to speak, which surprisingly does not give us any major literary pieces. The, lit the revolution of 1917 um, gave a stimulus uh, for um, artistic work, and this is reflected in the what we can find in the Hermitage Museum. But at present, I cannot find any new pieces. Probably uh, the Sh Shakitana's film, uh, The Neck, uh, this uh, tells us about the uh, uh, fighting provinces. But in our literature, we have not been able to see major pieces yet. And that is a problem, uh, not uh, in uh, the fact that politics uh, rules um, culture. This might be true, but this should always bring about major works of art. Um, I think the problem is today that we have not been able to see this as yet. Um, unfortunately. And here is one important thing. Do I have a question why this is not happening? No, I do not have an answer. But I can say why um, there might be some um, um, reason to that. Uh, in the, 20, uh, the 2020s, there was the ideology of Marxism that was very strong. That was 1920s, of course. There was the ideology, there was the clear-cut paradigm and the view of the future. Those who made revolution knew what they were doing. They had the image of the future. We can find that in the literary work of those days. After 10 years, they said there will be no criminals, the society will be um, ideal. They might have been wrong, uh, but they were. Um, they believed in that. At present, we do not have any image of the future. The humanity is moving into the future very quickly without turning back into the past, looking at the images in the past in order to get oriented for the future. So history is topical, but history is not always reflected in the new artistic achievements. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I remind you that Leo Tolstoy wrote War and Peace 57 years after the real events. In order to fully grasp uh, the meaning of a specific historical event, some time needs to elapse. You, I think, right, uh, revolution gave rise to many different um, uh, works of art. But uh, speaking about biography of Lenin, for example, um, uh, we only managed to create some story about it uh, many, many decades after that. Uh, uh, your quite polemic and provoking comment um, I see um, interesting and in how we can preserve the interest in reading historical literature in your perspective. Uh, do you think it is worth maintaining this interest? Yes, of course. The school curriculum, first and foremost, uh, needs to be carefully compiled, and it demonstrates that in the majority of cases, a person who did not read a specific piece during his uh, school years has very little, if any, chance of reading it becoming an adult. I think this is um, uh, an important to uh, raise a person to be a patriot and a uh, supporter of his own nation. So also good uh, screen adaptations help um, uh, the reading of the books and all the major school, school curriculum works have been adapted, like the Dostoevsky, like Dostoevsky's Idiot. Uh, there was a big uh, adaptation project, and many people were stimulated to reread the literary piece. We shouldn't be afraid to confront internet promoted brief summaries. I used to be a philosophy department and social sciences dean, 
um, uh, the whole of counted 15 minutes was something I once uh, um, confronted, and um, that was useful. You can gear back to some of the major works later if need be. So we need to cultivate a good reader using all the uh, available methods and tools. We shouldn't be afraid of experiment. Hence, uh, we will be interesting to the younger generation. But um, everyone, every librarian or bibliographer needs to remember the following. You shouldn't follow the young generation. You need to uh, make it follow you. Relying upon communication methods, you don't have to uh, be in the area guard. You have to be the director of the Republic of Skid, uh, Skid and not the teacher who sang the popular uh, song. So this is a question of pedagogical education culture. Thank you for this very compelling intervention of yours. And I'm giving the floor over to the publisher. I used to work for the publishing company for 20 years. But before that, I used to be a journalist and an editor in uh, the agency uh, Novosti. And I remember um, a newcomer. Uh, and I said, "Who is this guy?" And I said, and I learned he was an Italian person coming to Russia to work. Uh, it was um, uh, his was uh, his name was Sandro Tetti, and uh, we did not expect both of ourselves becoming publishers. Today he is one of the panelists, and I'm very happy they arrived here from Italy. And despite uh, a continuing trend. Uh, to uh, destroy the Russian culture, to cancel the Russian culture. He is the ambassador of truth to an extent, the ambassador of our culture, and the person who is not afraid to publish uh, uh, literature pieces related to very sensitive issues like the Middle East sensitive um, conflicts and the special military operation, and we really praise him for that. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and very specially to thank the Russian History Society. Uh, you ask me. You are our guest from uh, the UK about the Eisenstein's October. To what extent it is possible to distort uh, history. That, this is a, a telling example. The film that is titled uh, the, the, the Fine Life, The Wonderful Life, that was an Oscar winning film. Uh, life is Life is beautiful. Uh, this is the Dolce Vita film. And the, uh, the director was telling um, a lie because otherwise he wouldn't be um, awarded the Oscar Prize. And we saw how Americans uh, liberated Auschwitz. That is, uh, I don't even know how to put it, so it baffles verbal expression even. Also, in terms of Chagizait Matov, we have a lot of translations of this author. He was very popular and he visited Italy many times. He is one of the most popular and well-known writers uh, of the Central Asian republics. He is a real phenomenon because European culture and European historiography, uh, European school, is very Eurocentric. There are great, the greatest representatives of culture, philosophy, and art 
who used to write in Persian language, in, in Turkic and other languages that very few, if anyone, knows in the West. Uh, in Italy, I'm very proud to be the first to publish the full translation of Babur Nama. There are great writers and um, military commanders that are not known of in Italy or Europe at large. Besides, you mentioned that we are living through hard times now. Indeed, that's true. In this room, uh, we see a, a very famous, uh, Europe, Europe famous theater director, a writer, and a poet, and a scriptwriter, and a playwright. And he came to be participating on his own behalf. And he is not advertising the fact that he is director of a prestigious Italian theater. Because uh, uh, because he would have been fired had it become known. This is a state theater, I'm not joking. The forum is now the, the one of the United Cultures. Even in the area of culture, uh, we could feel it being very Russophobic, but there were some of the niches that were still available for experimenting and working. Um, uh, but uh, there is a president, president of uh, Italian uh, Society of, of uh, War Memorials, and uh, in uh, Russia, there are um, just the ashes, the remains of our soldiers. And he agreed to come here to thank uh, the, the Russian side to be part of the roundtable discussion that was organized. Now about history. I don't see any upsurge of... Uh, of, of literary activity dedicated to history. There are essay writers uh, who, in the last two years, uh, um, writing about Ukraine, uh, publishing books about Ukraine and Russia that wasn't of any interest before this all started. So, uh, I don't know where such budgets come from. Over 30 items uh, were funded. Hence, it is no, no easy, not an easy thing, uh, but we need to make a, a further effort because the Russian literature of this and uh, 19th and 20th culture century can be uh, available and found as to then historiography wise uh, very little if anything is available in Italy. What we can find are other different versions, interpretations of history distorted and untruthful. And I think we need to um, continue our effort in this respect. I was told uh, not to, uh, I was told to speak about some uh, TV shows uh, and series uh, on history. I, I know that you have many of them released now. Yet I would disagree in that uh, the Russian people, the viewers, uh, are more interested now in history than before. 
I don't think so. This is not demand. This is supply, rather. The country that forgot its past for a moment started producing films and writing, publishing books and making TV shows uh, about history. And the readers and viewers alike responded with great enthusiasm and interest. This is my perspective on what's happening. Should you have any questions or, for example, I just, I, I also wanted to talk about one more country, which is, which is also um, prosecuted my uh, neighbor's motherland, homeland. And um, I also discovered very important things about it. There are several Italian soldiers and officers in Belarus who um, fought against the Nazi and together with uh, uh, just paratroopers and detachments fought against them and died and were buried there. So this is a good reason to organize a joint activity or a joint event because it is uh, all rooted in history and uh, we can um, promote this uh, idea on the humanitarian front. Yes. So if uh, we try hard, then we, we can um, um, uh, support our relations and build relations uh, waiting for the uh, this cri critically difficult period to dis uh, go by. Uh, a question to you as a publisher. Don't you think that uh, historical literature reflects the national uh, specificity and translation of historical literature, uh, hist historical fiction into other languages is probably a strong th strengthening of the intercultural dialogue. Is it not so? Yes, that is uh, that is really so. It really um, stimulates uh, the intercultural dialogue. Uh, the uh, Yes, the uh, sp specificity of the country, yes, it is there. If we read um, uh, 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 these uh, stories um, presented by the people who lived at the time, who described that particular period of time. That's important not only for the historians, but for the uh, sociologists, for ethnologists, and uh, for many others. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. No, no colleagues, we have another participant. Um, uh, Mstislav Draga, and could could we have the microphone? Right. He is a, a dean of the Faculty of Philosophy of the University in Eastern Sarajevo. And uh, we will ask you to speak about the national historical memory. Uh, could you speak as a teacher, a philosopher? Well, thank you for the question, dear friends. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers and thus uh, uh, represent my country. Uh, 
trebao prvo krenuti od 822. godine, od onih znamenitih anala Franačkog kraljevstva i Hardovih. I would like to start with with the events Kada se srpsko nacionalno ime prvi put pojavljuje na prostoru zapadno od rijeke Drine, to jest na prostoru današnje Republike Srpske? When for the first time Serbia is mentioned in the western sources. Naravno, kroz čitavu istoriju literatura je igrala značajnu ulogu i u formiranju istorijske svijesti i u formiranju nacionalne svijesti srpskog naroda. In all days, literature played a very important role in the formation of the national identity of the Serbian people. Vijekovima, kako kaže veliki srpski istoričar Radovan Samaržić, glavu naroda držala uspravno. First of all, this is the the epic stories that will choose to form the Serbian literature. Velikih pisaca iz 20. vijeka čije je dijelo bilo apsolutno oslonjeno na istorijske izvore, to na primarne istorijske izvore. Učitavaju što vrijeme u nas ogranično, ja bih hoćela... With limited time, I would like to draw the attention of the forum participants to two authors who were so important in the 20th century for the formation of the identity, national identity. Obojici je zajedniško to da su rođeni na prostoru zapadno od rijeke Drine, na prostoru današnje Bosne i Hercegovine, odnosno Republike Srpske, a radi se o Ivi Andriću i Jovanu Dučiću. So it's Ivan Andrić and Dudić who were both born in Bosnia-Herzegovina. They were both founding their works on the historical sources and Ivanić's doctor's dissertation was also based on historical sources. Sandrić used to say that only stupid people do not understand that the past is dead and does not have an impact on the present. Samo na njegovo zaista izuzetno dijelo Grof Sava Vladislavić. As for Dotic, I would like to remind you of his piece, which is called The Blood of Sava. Kojom je srpskoj kulturi vratio jednog zaista znamenitog njenog pripadnika, inače savjetnika Petra Velikog, čovjeka koji je puno značio u srpskoj i u ruskoj istoriji. Which mentions one of the characters of the Serbian history, in Serbian history. Više izlagao, samo bih još jednom izrazio svoju zahvalnost, posebno našim dragim kolegama i prijateljima iz Ruskog istorijskog društva. So, with that, I would like to finish and express my gratitude once in a day from our colleagues from the Russian Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. We have gone beyond the time allocated to our session, so allow me to say a couple of words to round up the session. Uh, I would like to thank all for all the, express my gratitude to all the participants of our discussion, and I would like to wish all the guests of the forum interesting um, days here in St. Petersburg in the most beautiful city of Russia. Enjoy the cultural events, the discussions uh, um, at many venues, and uh, I wish all of us uh, to be able to um, foster intercultural dialogue, um, forgetting the stupidity that occurs in the world around us. And um, culminating in the cultural cancellation. Now, we're not like that. We'll stand against this. Thank you all.